Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you. And before I do what I was brought up here to do, I just want to make a, a quick observation. Um, I think everybody in this room probably had about a dozen really good and productive things that you could be doing to further your mission this morning. Um, and I can't think of a more important place to be to really be getting that broader context about the work we do, about the trends that are coming. Um, and I'm really excited to see that so many of you feel that way as well. Um, so thank you for coming. I'd also like to acknowledge, I think, how fortunate our region is that it doesn't matter what sector you're in, we've got great infrastructure organizations that really help to educate us, to challenge us, to get us together and help us to collaborate and innovate. Um, and our hosts for the nonprofit sector are two of the very best. So thank you both to Mary McMurtry and Amy Rome. <laughs> 10 years of, of fantastic leadership, so this is great. So what I was brought up here to do um, is to introduce the person that we're also very fortunate to have with us today. Uh, you all have his bio in front of you, so I'm not going to go into depth there. Um, but please join me in welcoming Dr. Rob Reich, a thought leader in the sector, uh, co-director of the Center for, for Philanthropy and Civil Society at Stanford. And uh, you know, I think that we're going to have some, some great thoughts from his comments. Rob. Good morning, everyone. So uh, you have a bio in front of you, but it's possible that it's just now dawning on you that I am not the former Secretary of Labor. <laughs> um, it happens on occasion that I'm invited to places and people in the audience do think that they're about to receive some type of address by the former Secretary of Labor, and it's something I've had to deal with for a little while now, a friend of mine gave me a good line to use in cases like this, and, and, and I'll just pass it along. As you can see, if you're a political junkie, you probably know um, a bit about Bob Reich, is how he pronounces his name. Um, I am uh, lesser in stature, but much greater in height. <laughs> so, I'm a political philosopher by training. I teach in the political science department at Stanford in my courses. Uh, my research is mainly in political philosophy. I'm interested in things such as what role should philanthropy and the nonprofit sector play in a flourishing democracy? What should the policy framework be that structures foundations in the nonprofit sector? And what role does the sector play in relation to commercial for profit businesses as well as to the public um, state institutions that we have? So these are big picture questions, essentially asking things about what the nature of the social contract is in a democracy, or in the United States in particular. Now, um, you guys are not here to hear a political philosophy lecture, and um, I'm excited to try to present some different ideas intended for a non-academic audience, a practitioner audience, an audience I'm, I'm excited to present to and don't often get to see. So I'm not going to be delivering a philosophy lecture, and I won't try to pretend that I know the view from St. Louis. Um, you guys are much more knowledgeable about the local landscape here, and we've just heard a bit um, before uh, these remarks uh, about the local landscape. I can heartily recommend to you, by the way, the, um, the report on giving in St. Louis, which I had a chance to look at um, just, just recently. I think it gives a, a really detailed and interesting overview about what's going on. So instead, I'm going to give you a view from 35,000 feet. This is the way the philosopher prefers to operate try to give you something that gives you a much more overall view about some very large forces that are at work, both in our entire society and in particular in the nonprofit and philanthropic sector. So what I hope to do is spend about 25 minutes talking about, first about five macro trends within society as a whole that are having a profound effect on the philanthropic and nonprofit sector, and then five micro trends from within the philanthropic and nonprofit sector that are reshaping the landscape from within. And when you combine these five macro trends with these five micro trends, what I want to submit to you is that there is enormous change going on today. One other way to situate my remarks, um, we all like to think in metaphors. It's part of the importance of storytelling, is being able to convey one's views in metaphors. Um, 
Very frequently today, we hear the use or the invocation of natural disaster metaphors. Diana Aviv, who's the CEO of the independent sector, has described the current moment in the United States with respect to the nonprofit sector as a coming tsunami, where reforms in the tax code that could affect charitable giving, in particular changes to the charitable contributions deduction, could fundamentally restructure how it is that nonprofits operate. Others point to what they call a perfect storm of federal, state, and local budget cuts and declines in charitable giving overall that together threaten the fiscal health of many nonprofits. So we've got, on the one hand, a coming tsunami, a perfect storm. I am not so eager to sign on to either of these particular metaphors. And what I want to submit to you is that there's a much better, potentially also fundamentally disastrous, but also with some real promise. <laughs> the metaphor I prefer is the tectonic shift. The tectonic shift suggests that there are forces certainly beyond our control, deep underground, that are reshaping some of the fundamental building blocks, um, the rules, the framework in which we operate. And I think this is a better way to understand the set of forces at work today in the nonprofit and philanthropic sector. So as I go through these five micro, uh, macro trends and then five micro trends, what I want you to keep in mind is the idea of a tectonic shift. OK, so let's look at some macro trends. Five things that are happening outside the world of philanthropy and nonprofits that are having a massive effect on philanthropy and nonprofits. Well, the first one, which everyone here knows about, it's already been referenced this morning, is that there are ongoing massive state, local, and federal deficits. Simply put, the public coffers are depleted. And this is having a huge effect, of course, on the revenue streams that many nonprofits depend upon. And of course, uh, having a massive effect far beyond nonprofits. I can tell you from my local landscape out in California a few anecdotes, and I'm sure you could fill in other examples here locally. Um, uh, there was just an interesting story in which I participated that recounted the plight of state parks in California, in which a large number of state parks have been zeroed out from public, public support and, in, in effect, have been closed where on occasion, at some of the more beautiful parks that are more populated, local philanthropists have stepped in to um, plug the funding gap. And instead of having public, public parks supported by public dollars, we have public ports supported by philanthropic dollars. Now, um, that's a lovely and noble thing, perhaps very important to do. But of course, what it sends a signal to the state um, is that the state will no longer have to be on the hook. It can offload to philanthropic um, entities support for something that had routinely been part of the state budget. Similarly, I think an even more worrying story is the story about libraries in California, public libraries. Public libraries are, of course, one of the paradigmatic examples in the United States of philanthropic success, started by Andrew Carnegie with the, an initial um, um, foundation he started back in the early 20th century. Um, the idea of a public library was something that he created and then um, a challenge grants to localities to pony up public money in order to create the entities that we know today and that are spread across the entire country and indeed across many parts of the world. In California this past year, the state funding for libraries has been put to zero, absolutely nothing, leaving local um, entities to pick up the funding or again to philanthropists. And so we see a story about a magnificent institution, the institution of the library, created by philanthropic vision, then brought to scale when it was um, created as a, as a large state and local enterprise, now going backwards to being once again something that depends upon philanthropy. Um, this is a story, as I say, about the massive federal, state, and local benefits, uh, deficits, deficits that are cutting the funding that has often gone to support things that were either created initially by the visionary ideas of nonprofit leaders and foundation leaders or done in partnership with them. Now, I want to say that these have had two massive um, effects, two big effects. The first is obviously that in a time of greater need for individuals in the scope of a recession, a, a massive economic downturn, there's less money from the state to try and fill those needs 
putting much greater burden, especially in the social service sector of the nonprofit sector. But additionally, federal, state, and local um, um, treasuries have sought to generate new revenue from the nonprofit sector. And that's the second macro trend I want to point to. How is it that the nonprofit sector could be a source of revenue for a locality, a state, or the federal government? Well, the simple answer to that is through changes in the tax code. Um, it's not the only um, place to do this, but it's a, a, a very important place. Um, what Diana Aviv from the independent sector was referring to when she said uh, that there was a worry about a coming tsunami was that variety of proposals, chiefly coming from President Obama about the um, budgets he wanted to enact, involved tinkering with the charitable contributions deduction and lowering modestly in President Obama's proposal the incentive for people to give to charity. Um, Obama has proposed this in several of the past, uh, in, in each of the past couple of years. And now, of course, we see a whole variety of efforts to enact comprehensive tax reform, which would not be a way just to tinker with the charitable contributions deduction, but to um, try to simplify across the board the very complicated federal tax system that we all know and do not love. <laughs> comprehensive tax reform may, in fact, be a very important undertaking. And in fact, I predict in the wake of the 2012 election coming up that we're going to see all kinds of new debate about what kind of tax reform might be possible. But one of the essential elements of many proposals, and it, it seems odd to say it, but this is essentially the, 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 the seed of a potential compromise, is that fundamental tax reform, comprehensive tax reform, might lower tax rates for individuals but in, at the same moment, increase revenue to the state. Um, how is that possible to lower tax rates and yet increase revenue? It's possible by getting rid of or changing a lot of the tax incentives, loopholes and deductions and credits that are littered across the entirety of the tax code, of which the charitable contribution deduction is one. So if, in fact, um, Congress decides to make fundamental changes to the tax code, it is indeed possible that the mechanism we now know and have had in place for quite a long time, the incentive to give by deducting um, whatever the gift is you make to a, 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 an eligible 501c3 organization, could be changed. Now, um, I won't rehearse the variety of different proposals that are on the table, but I'll mention just one of them because I think it's at least a, in a, an instance of creative out-of-the-box thinking. One of the deficit commissions created last year um, proposed the following change to the charitable contributions deduction. The idea was to e eliminate it. There would be no incentive to give in the, in the, in the way that we currently know it. And instead replace it with a, with a, uh, a 1%, uh, uh, excuse me, replace it with a tax credit rather than a tax deduction, but only after any individual first gave 1% of his or her income away on his or her own dime, as it were. So the idea is, tell every American there's a tax credit for a charitable contribution waiting for you, but before you are eligible to claim it, first give away 1% of your income. Now, economists would love to study this type of change. It would be a really interesting, as they call it, natural experiment. Um, it's an open question, of course, whether that would deliver more money or less money, what the change would be. My point is only, again, to illustrate that there are genuinely novel proposals on the table in Washington that could fundamentally change the policy structure that we have known for a long time in the nonprofit sector. Okay, the third trend, something that you, again, located outside the context of philanthropy and nonprofits, but I think having a huge and underappreciated effect on the sector. It's the post-Citizens United world in which nonprofit organizations, chiefly here 501c4 organizations, are much more full-throatedly political agents in a way that has historically not been part of the nonprofit sector, especially, of course, within the 501c3 category where there are strict limits on political activity. The Citizens United Supreme Court decision in 2010 has unleashed a torrent of nonprofit activity in political affairs. 501c4s that can raise anonymous money to be deployed as issue advertising in the context of campaigns and elections. And the world of charitable organizations is now ever more interwoven with the electioneering and what I consider, and I hope you consider to be, the unholy nexus of money and politics. 
My worry is that as more and more Americans learn of the role that nonprofit organizations are playing in issue advertising, in full-throated partisan political electioneering, they will come to see the nonprofit sector as a whole as yet another interest group political agent, tainting the significant trust that the American public puts into the work of nonprofits because they view them more or less as apolitical, non-political agents carrying out a social mission, not a political mission. So as the Citizens United decision reshapes the way that campaign finance works, it is politicizing the nonprofit sector as a whole. And let's face it, the average American does not distinguish in his or her head between a 501c4 and a 501c3, though anyone in this room who cares about the distinction certainly knows the difference. The issue here is the trustworthiness of the sector, and I think it's somewhat at stake now. The fourth macro trend, something that you hardly need a political scientist to tell you. <laughs> Massive and enduring dysfunction at the federal level of politics. Now, political scientists can offer all kinds of explanations for this. Um, redistricting efforts that are highly partisan that have created a Congress that is polarized in a way that it never has been before. Um, the unholy nexus of money and politics that cements into place um, a variety of people with special interests in Congress. The revolving door between lobbyists and um, the, the halls of Congress. There are all types of explanations, and I don't need to mention them um, to you here. I want to mention the effect that the dysfunction at the federal level is having on nonprofits. The first and most important thing is that whereas Americans hope and expect, and um, rightly so, wish for Congress to deal with the nation's business in a way that would solve problems for everyone, working perhaps in a bipartisan way when necessary, what we get now is enduring gridlock, and instead, of our Congress dealing with the increasing complexity and needs of Americans in the wake of a recession, um, a lot of that demand is being offloaded to the nonprofit sector to pick up the slack. And so more and more is being asked of nonprofits at a time when more and more should be expected. And I don't mean here in terms of programs or services or revenue. What I mean is in terms of action and policy making and creativity in Congress. Now. Um, one thing that some Congress um, folks have pointed to is that whereas they feel stuck within the political system in Washington, D.C., nonprofits and foundations are set up to have a much longer time horizon. They don't have to look to an election in order to feel whether or not they'll be kept, kept um, in place, they'll still have a job. They can think about um, only what's, whatever a short time horizon is possible. Nonprofits and foundations, by contrast, can think over the long term. And as a result, many people are looking to foundations for actually poli actual policy leadership. I mean, one good example of this, if um, any of you in the room are connected with education, is to look at the role that the Gates Foundation has played within uh, American education reform. It is perhaps the leading agent of forwarding a policy agenda at the federal level for education in a way that um, there are explicit partnerships between the Federal Department of Education and the Gates Foundation and several other foundations. So the idea here again is that the apolitical or non-political nonprofit sector, foundation sector, can try to do things that a dysfunctional federal level political system cannot, putting new demands on, on the work that we do. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, there's a tension here between number three and number four. On the one hand, the nonprofit sector is being politicized. On the other hand, because of dysfunction in Congress, um, they're looking to a non-political or apolitical nonprofit sector. That will be an interesting tension to see how that plays out. Okay, finally, fifth macro trend, perhaps one that you are all aware of in some hazy way or another, um, what I like to call a massive blurring of the boundaries between sectors. And what I mean by sectors here is the, the for-profit sector and the nonprofit sector, and sometimes even public agencies. Um, we all know that nonprofits these days are asked to operate more and more like for profit businesses. Create a revenue stream, get a management consulting group to come in and give you strategic advice. And at the same time, many businesses are operating more and more like nonprofits. They take on a social mission and attempt to craft what they sometimes call a double bottom line. So, commercial for profit businesses now operate frequently as if they had a nonprofit social mission. 
Think of corporate social responsibility or the idea of a social enterprise firm. At the same time, nonprofit organizations now operate frequently as if they were operated as commercial for-profit businesses. Think of the increased discussion of revenue from services, of importing business metrics that focus on deliverables, measurable outcomes. We also see the dawning of an age where instead of a social entrepreneur thinking to him or herself, well, I want to create some type of organization that has a social mission, and I could incorporate myself as a for-profit business, or I could create myself as a 501c3 nonprofit. Which should I do? In seven states to date, there is legislation that allows you to create what is called a B corporation, a benefits corporation, which is essentially a hybrid between a for-profit and a nonprofit. The B corporation is not obligated to maximize um, um, profit, as a for-profit traditionally is. Um, it has to generate revenue and return something to shareholders. But at the same time, it can pursue a social mission. And these B corporations are being experimented with, as I say, in seven states so far. I think it's a trend worth paying attention to. Finally, um, we heard uh, earlier from Mary about the massive changes and demands over the longer haul in leadership within the nonprofit sector. One of the consequences, in certain ways an interesting consequence, of the blurring of the boundaries between sectors is the effect it will have on the human capital that flows into the work of what has been historically the mission of a nonprofit. And I'll give you just a small anecdote to illustrate this. Um, I've been teaching at Stanford about 12, 13 years, and I, and I know from colleagues who teach um, here at Wash U that the situation is not dissimilar here. It's, it's quite similar. Um, Almost every student I teach at Stanford has a positive view of the idea of social entrepreneurship. And they think of themselves, no matter what kind of professional aspiration they have, as wanting to act as a social entrepreneur. It doesn't matter if they're a classics major, computer science major. Each thinks of him or herself as pursuing something with a social mission. And the upshot is that students can be what I want to call sector agnostic. They can believe that no matter what sector they join, they will be doing some social good. In concrete terms, what this means at Stanford is that they think to themselves, um, I'm a do-gooder. I want to change the world for the better. If I go to work for Google or Facebook, that is completely consistent with my vision of changing the world for the better. <laughs> and in certain respects, you must be thinking, well, they want to have their cake and eat it too. That is an, you know, an interesting criticism, but I, I can tell you from personal experience, that does not resonate with your average 20-year-old. They think to themselves that Google has a genuinely worthy social mission, do no evil, create search for the world for free, <laughs> give email to people and all the rest of Google documents that probably you use yourselves. It's not a crazy thought, actually, but the implication here is, of course, is that many of the people who consider themselves do-gooders, who imagined for themselves a future that almost certainly involved employment in a 501c3 nonprofit, now are open to the idea, in fact, actively pursue the idea that they can be sector agnostic and employ themselves in a for-profit organization that they believe also has a social mission. That will change the recruiting practices, I believe, of large nonprofits that need human capital but that human capital now is not convinced that the social mission attaches only to a 501c3. OK, let's move to the micro trends that are um, occurring within the nonprofit and philanthropic sector. Some of these have been mentioned already, but I want to start with just a little catalog of different and new forms of giving, um, some of these that are technologically enabled. So, we have a whole lot of new ways to get involved in, in um, um, giving. Um, some of them involve web platforms. So you've probably heard of an organization called Kiva, which you can be a, um, you can, um, be a, 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 a micro loan investor. You can scroll through a website which gives, um, gives you information about people who are looking for small, small loans across the world. And you can then choose the person you wish to invest in. Similarly with Donors Choose, for those of you who looked at that for funding, the, classroom project of American school teachers. So we have web platforms that are not possible to enact anywhere else except the web. Um, it was mentioned already uh, that there is more and more giving happening online. So instead of writing a check, 
or showing up to a special event. You simply um, interact through a, a, web, a, a, web, a, a website and you give money online. Now, I discovered uh, an interesting factoid, um, and this I, I offer as perhaps the only piece of practical advice um, I'll offer today to those of you who are trying to increase revenue for your own organization. 20% of all online giving happens on one of two days during the year, December 30th or December 31st. <laughs> when faced with the looming tax deadline of getting your charitable contributions logged in, you go online to give. So 20% of all giving happens on December, of all online giving ha happens on December 30th or December 31st. There's enormous potential to try to build out mechanisms online that reach people and increase that giving and spread it out across the year. A couple more examples. Um, I hope you've all heard of an organization called Kickstarter. Kickstarter is an example of crowdsourced funding. Put up a project online, you usually attach a video to it, and then you ask people to contribute in some amount or another. Um, Kickstarter can be for things that are nonprofits, for things that are for profits, for art, uh, for art and film projects. It's a very interesting platform in trying to crowdsource funding in a way that hasn't happened before. And then we've got some more interesting investment, charitable investment opportunities like donor advised funds and social impact bonds. Um, I won't give you a description of those, I just want to offer that up as a general catalog. So let's go to the second micro trend. I've, I canvassed for you a whole bunch of different forms of giving many of them technologically enabled. The second um, micro trend I want to mention is impact investing. Impact investing is the attempt of various people to attach the entire language that, it, that is oriented around the traditional investment world, looking for a return on one's investment, to the efforts we make as charitable donors. So we introduced phrases like charitable return on investment, philanthropic return on investment. And instead of thinking as any donor having essentially something like a charity budget, which they decide to give away however they see fit, you think about the full range of your resources that might be deployed in any number of ways, not only to charities, as trying to have an impact. So the way this operates sometimes in foundations is foundations, of course, make grants that are subject to a 5% payout rule. And some foundations are now experimenting, perhaps some of you in the room representing foundations that do such experiments or you know, new, uh, attempts at this. They also invest their endowment resources in certain ways which are meant to be matched to the mission of the grant making they make. And that can take the form of offering low interest loans to some of the entrepreneurs or, or 501c3s that they fund through their grant making. It can also mean, interestingly, purposefully creating a hybrid foundation. Now, there are a couple of these in my area out in Silicon Valley. The Omidyar Network, most prominently, um, started by the guy who um, began eBay. Um, the Omidyar Network um, is a dual, has a dual structure. It's a traditional um, grant-making um, foundation in certain ways, in which there are program officers that make grants to 501c3 organizations. But they also make seed investments in for-profit startup companies, which they believe equally forward the mission that they have set for themselves. So say, um, you know, new, new startup companies that are trying out things in clean, clean technology. Some of these are incorporated as for-profit entities. The Midiar Network, when it invests in these, is equally happy, because what it seeks is impact, is equally happy to invest in a 501c3 with a green mission, or a for-profit company that's a startup with a green mission. Impact investors are said to focus entirely on the impact they can make with indifference to the organization and even the organizational form that is striving to make that impact. Again, an example of the blurring of the boundaries between the sectors. Third micro-trend, an increasing focus on measurable outcomes. Now, um, those of you in the room here can't be immune to this. The, the kind of discourse around nonprofits has been for the past decade orienting, orienting, itself, orienting itself more and more towards outcomes, measurement, metrics, impact. That's the kind of importing from the for-profit business world, a whole set of analytical tools to try to capture what kind of impact any nonprofit has. And more and more donors are demanding information about the impact that donors have. 
So as I said before, I think it, now it's actually a sensible thing, um, something that happens in the minds of at least some donors, to ask of a nonprofit that requests money from them, well, what would be my charitable return on my investment in your nonprofit? Give me some data to suggest to me why I should have confidence that you will create the outcomes you've promised. And in fact, there's an entire new group of ratings agencies that, design, that are designed to try to rate the effectiveness of nonprofits. Now, you probably all know about Charity Navigator and their model, but there are a whole variety of other ones like Philanthropedia, um, the one that is perhaps most rigorous and analytic in terms of the data it demands is called GiveWell, based out of New York. It tries to rate the effectiveness mainly of charities that operate in the space of education in the United States and then overseas that are working on development issues. But if you take a look at the reports that they write up on charities, you'll see they're extraordinarily detailed. They look something like the kind of reports you'd expect from a stock manager about a for-profit investment. Let me try to put this in a very dramatic way, because here is a potential fundamental shift in the psychology of donors, if in fact this outcome, measurable impact orientation really takes hold amongst a lot of people. These days, if you have a bunch of money and you're thinking about making a charitable donation and perhaps even setting up a foundation of your own, the traditional thing that an advisor to you would try to do is they say, well, first, let me learn about what you're passionate about. Tell me about your values. Tell me about the things that you care about in the world. And once you tell me that, I'll try to give you some advice about better and worse ways of giving your money away. But the idea first is to start with the passion of the individual. If you think that impact investing along the lines of what some of these organizations want it to be is meant to build itself out across the entire nonprofit sector, the idea of starting with any individual's passion, starting with the heart, is not the way they want you to think about the world. They want you to say, tell me where my money can make the most impact, and that's what I'll become passionate about. Is it in the arts? Well, I want a story about the outcome I can make in the arts. Is it in the environment? Is it in education? Is it in animals? They want to try to compare the outcomes you can achieve even across these various domains, and that is what they will become passionate about. Now, um, I mentioned that as a possible outcome. I want to also caution one of the ways in which this has the potential to upend the policy framework of the entire, entire charitable sector. You all probably know um, there was a, a, a table up there just before about you know, so somewhere along the lines of $300 billion given away every year in the United States, and you all know the largest category of, um, um, of uh, nonprofits that receives um, charitable dollars in the US. It's religion, and it's not faith-based social services. It's the church and synagogue and mosque. It's the, the place where we um, congregate for our religious practices. Um, the largest recipient of charitable dollars. Now I ask you, what would it mean to apply an impact orientation to our giving to our church? Can you really imagine asking, say, if you go to the Catholic Church, well, I understand that the Episcopals across town are really, really getting a much better impact, made a much greater outcomes over there. And I'm thinking about shifting. <laughs> that just seems to me a non-starter. Um, so because we have a 501c3 sector, which lumps every kind of nonprofit under the sun into this one catch-all category, the more and more an impact orientation takes hold and tells donors, ask for data, look for outcomes, let that drive your giving, the more pressure there will be to begin to disaggregate or differentiate the sector even further. Because the idea of applying an outcome orientation to religious giving, the largest form of giving in the United States, does not seem like it has much traction. Okay, I'm going to go through two more um, micro trends. The fourth one is something I've mentioned already. It's this experimentation with new organizational forms, creating through policy hybrid organizations like B corporations or sometimes called flexible, flexible purpose corporations. And as I said before, legislation has already created these in seven states, and there is an effort to try to expand that beyond um, the number that are already there. And fifth, uh, and finally here, um, something uh, that has been in the news uh, for quite a while now. There is new and massive forms of wealth and income inequality in the US. It's in certain respects what the Occupy movement, if that's what we want to call it, has been trying to draw attention to. 
Now, what does that mean for the nonprofit and philanthropic sector? Well, in part, of course, because of the recession, there is much greater need. But in part, because of this massive wealth inequality, there are more and more Americans than historically there have been who have sufficient resources to become significant donors. So the number of family foundations in the United States has rocketed upward in the past decade, decade as there has been new forms of wealth created, new, many, many more people who are wealthy. We have much more significant individual and family philanthropy in most areas of the country than we've had before at the same time as we've had increasing need for social services amongst those who have not been fortunate enough um, to participate in this wealth creation. So the existence of massive wealth inequality creates an interesting challenge for nonprofits, it seems to me. On the one hand, you have a potential new source of donors, people who weren't sufficiently wealthy before that they could imagine giving some significant money away. On the other hand, you have much greater need, especially if you're a social service nonprofit, and you're seeing that every day on the ground, I predict. Okay, let me draw these remarks to a, to a quick close. Um, the lesson I want you to take away from my talk today is that there's a profoundly changing landscape, um, tectonic shifts beneath our feet. Massive underground forces at work that are redefining the size, the scope, and the role of government, business, and the independent sector. We're seeing nothing less than the emergence of a new social compact or a new social contract. These, challenges, these changes are affecting not only the nonprofit sector, but the entirety of our society and democracy. We are seeing a redefinition of the role and responsibility of the marketplace, of the state, and of civil society. And it's this redefinition, here's the wee bit of a forthrightly, sincerely offered philosophical challenge to ask of all of you. It's this redefinition of the marketplace, civil society, and the state that ought to command our collective attention. And nonprofits have historically been the chief place in which Americans come together to promote and promulgate their voice about what they wish the public or the collective to be. As these tectonic shifts are taking place, my hope is that the nonprofit sector will not, not only respond in such a way as to act wisely in the face of these large challenges, but also to be a conduit for citizen voice across the entire country so that all people had a say in how it is that these changes are affecting our entire society. Now, I want to end on one final uh, local note. Um, the, um, well, let me put this a local note in a, in a slightly more cheerful note, because of the natural disaster metaphor, <laughs> you know, gives one over to pessimistic thoughts. Um, this is a picture of uh, total charitable giving in the United States from 1969 to 2011. And you'll see that it, it rose considerably as wealth inequality in the United States um, 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 occurred between the 19, in the 1990s and into 2000s. And then the recession hit. I'm not sure if you can see the shaded vertical bars. Those are recession years. So you'll see that regularly total giving in the US goes down during a recession. Now, that's a common sense finding. If people have less money, they feel greater need, um, giving goes down. But I want to give you a slightly more cheerful um, data point as you think about this and the needs of your organization and what happens here in St. Louis. Despite the fact that charitable giving in the United States is down over the past couple years um, relative to its high in 2007, there's one really positive aspect to this I want to call your attention to. As a percentage of GDP, giving is more or less constant. So it's true that people give less as they have fewer resources. But they continue to give more or less the same percentage as they've given across a long period of time. So if we put up the slide that shows giving as a percentage of GDP, Americans have been giving roughly between 1.8 and 2.2% of GDP for about 40 years. And it's been robust even in the face of the current recession. Which is to say that while people are giving less money as an absolute amount, total giving has gone down, in their own heads they have something like a baseline of giving which has been constant, roughly 2%. Now that's something to feel, I think, enormous optimism about, that Americans have this disposition to give away a certain amount of money, as it were, a charitable, a charitable budget in their head. Not a total amount, but a percentage amount. A form of a tithe, if you will. And that's something we should all feel proud about and can feel some confidence in as we look to the future. 
Thanks very much. Rob, thank you for, for those insights and ideas. Um, I think I speak for everyone when I say that hearing your perspective on all this is, is really helpful.